Very good. So much fun to be here. <laughs> so interesting. Um, so, uh, is it? Is and there's a, reco- a video. Is that right? Yeah. Oh, fantastic. Makeup. <laughs> <laughs> Spent all the budget on the camera. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, sh- shall I begin? Yeah. Um, so, thank you. Thank you so much, um, Ido and Michal, especially for arranging this. Um, my name is Jonathan Colib. I'm a senior lecturer at the Graduate School of Business and Law at RMIT University in Melbourne, Australia. Not Rimmit or Rimmit or anything <laughs> that a frog sounds like. Uh, RMIT. It's like, I like to say, MIT in Boston, everyone's heard of. No one gets their name wrong. The R is for the royal, because the Queen of England is still the Queen of Australia. Um, um, I should st- start by saying this is the final day I have on a three-week trip uh, uh, abroad. So my thoughts are a little deliberately uh, muddled. Um, and puzzled and even more complicated than they were when this trip began. In fact, that was the whole purpose of this trip um, and indeed why I reached out to uh, Ido and the Minerva Centre in the first place. Um, I'll tell you a little bit about the trip because I think it's useful background um, <coughs> to the research and then we'll get into um, the, the, uh, the substance of the presentation which is about the question of how to achieve responsible business conduct in conflict affected areas. And I argue that international humanitarian law, otherwise known as the laws of war or um, uh, laws of armed conflict, um, are really should be to the fore. And they're not. In fact, they're not really part of that responsible business conversation um, to any great degree at the moment. That should be rectified. That's, you know, in 25 words or less, the next hour and a half. So we can all pack up and go and have coffee. Um, no. So, um, so the, um, the start of my three weeks away was at, in Geneva uh, for the United Nations Forum on Business and Human Rights, which is an annual forum that started, I think, uh, uh, eight years ago now, nine years ago. And it's an opportunity for academics, civil society, companies and governments to get together and talk about business and human rights. Uh, Business and human rights is now, I would say, the leading sort of framing uh, or discourse um, around businesses' social responsibilities. CSR uh, was last century. Uh, We talked a little bit about sustainability. And now, especially for um, international legal scholars like myself, very much uh, the framing is business and human rights. I would say if you have a look at the sustainability reports of most major multinational companies, they have also adopted the human rights language um, uh, to to report on their um, engagement with uh, external stakeholders and society at large. there was a range of side events and workshops and conferences around that. My interest uh, in the business and human rights conversation is around business and human rights applied to conflict affected areas. Um, the UN guiding principles on business and human rights, and we'll come back to it in a second, but that is the leading um, document in this space um, in terms of a governance document crafted in 2011 Uh, and that says that businesses should pay even greater attention should prioritize their operations and their involvement in conflict affected areas why because that's where gross human rights abuses occur Um, yet to date not much has been done uh, specifically around uh, what does that mean for governments for civil society for academia and also for the business people (coughs) Um, in terms of practical um, uh, guidelines as to how they should operate and and what they should be doing in those areas. Um, After Geneva, it's a long way to schlep from Melbourne, Australia. So I spent a few days uh, in Geneva. I do some work with the uh, Red Cross. So I had some consultations, we'll get to that, uh, with the International Committee of the Red Cross as well. 
a few other actors over in Geneva. But um, about 10 years ago, uh, some mentors of mine told me, um, you know what, stay away from engaging in the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. You know, it's not good for your career, basically. Not, not for your sanity, not for your mental health. Um, this is where I cut my teeth, frankly. This is where my journey from hu on human rights and conflict resolution started. I was here in 1996, uh, the year after my high school. Um, I was studying at a Jewish seminary um, in the West Bank in a place called uh, Yeshiva Haritzion, in the Etzion block. Um, very famous history, pre-48, 1948 history even. Anyway, my bus stop blew up one day. 96, you may recall, it was a bad year. Um, I have a habit of bringing bad years, by the way. 2001, I also was here. Um, also a bad year. 2005, I think, was the disengagement. Also a bad year. I um, was here for that too. Um, so, I'm hopping on a plane tomorrow. Don't worry. Just so wait far. until the next election is <laughs> Right. Um, yes, I was the one that brought on the third election. That's right. Um, no. Um, it's the end of the year, so we, we don't have too much time. Uh, right, right. <laughs> right. <laughs> no, it's, um, Let's hope so this time. Yeah, um, so I, I mean, I'm, I'm rambling a bit, but uh, I came back uh, and spent the last 10 days here talking to people on the ground in academia, in civil society, and just trying to re-engage. Um, life is too short, and uh, I would like to play a constructive role uh, in healing relations, uh, resolving the conflict, you know, all those large, bold goals that we all have, um, would like to play a meaningful, constructive role in, from my perch in academia in Melbourne. Um, so I'm here essentially um, exposing myself, again, to the conflict, but to people like yourselves. Um, and if I can be of any assistance, uh, any partners or uh, partnership or whatever, be it research or practical support or funding support, I'd be more than happy to have those conversations. Um, so this is my fact-finding mission, if you will. Um, and it's also in that spirit that I share this work. Uh, we really, I've been reflecting, this is not focused on Israel-Palestine, uh, this work that I'll present. But you can't help but look at it through that prism. And again, I would be uh, really appreciate your uh, comments and, and the conversation after the presentation about how this might all relate to the, the conflict here, if at all. Um, okay. That was a long personal introduction, but I hope useful. So about the, an introduction to the work. So uh, it would be remiss of me not to acknowledge the Australian Red Cross. Uh, I'm in a research collaboration, research partnership with the Australian Red Cross to do this work. Not just the academic scholarly piece, which is uh, what I'm trying to do, uh, but also very practical, um, uh, practically focused. Essentially, two years ago, the Australian Red Cross said, you know what? Australian businesses are operating in complex, conflict-prone, conflict environments overseas. Uh, Australia has one of the largest number of extractive companies, that, uh, mining companies that operate around the world. Africa, Southeast Asia, South America, um, conflict hotspots. The Red Cross, either in Geneva, to a lesser extent, but certainly in terms of national Red Cross societies have never engaged with the business sector as an addressee of compliance with international humanitarian law. I'm going to start calling it IHL, if that's okay with everybody. IHL, International Humanitarian Law. Um, always the dissemination, the education, the awareness work that has been done has been to governments and militaries. Um, so the Australian Red Cross do amazing work training uh, the Australian military, also militaries from across the Asia-Pacific region, um, and work that should be applauded. But they realised there was a gap. Again, 
that the only engagement they've had with the business sector was seeking money, donations, um, uh, for their emergency work, humanitarian preparedness and humanitarian response work. So about two years ago, we started off engaging the Australian corporate sector. There's not so much I can share about that, perhaps when the, um, the, the cameras and the, you know, YouTube is turned off, we can have a, a, a full and frank conversation about some of those things. But um, this research stems from that, and it has that practical goal in mind, to provide companies with better guidance when they go off to the Democratic Republic of Congo, when they go off to Mali, when they go off to um, Myanmar, um, and we have Australian companies in all those um, conflict situations at the moment, but they are better equipped to handle uh, what it means to be a responsible business and to really live up to um, the claims of being of upholding human rights uh, and of being uh, you know and upholding responsible business practices. So that's um, the origins of it. Okay. Let me uh, get stuck in a little bit into and, and uh, into the, the actual um, presentation that I wanted to the tuchless, as they say, um, and then hopefully you, know, you guys can cut me off after 20 minutes, 30 minutes maybe, and we can have a, a conversation, uh, which I'd really um, appreciate. Um, okay, so um, BHR, business and human rights, is the dominant discourse, in my opinion, for how companies engage uh, in responsible business practices these days. I've mentioned the annual forum. If you go and have a look at sustainability reports, I think there is a, a very much human rights is the frame. There's a long, long history of business and human rights and a very complicated one. And so again, a little uh, by way of introduction, in the 1970s, uh, way back when, um, a few uh, um, developing countries decided it would be good to regulate the conduct and the practice of transnational corporations. Why? Um, for a variety of reasons, uh, but a lot of these new states, uh, decolonized post-colonial states, feared that uh, the spread of transnational corporations from the West was simply neo-colonialism, colonialism in another guise. So they started trying to regulate, talking about binding human rights obligations for companies. They set up a UN center for transnational corporations that uh, did not end up with any binding norms nor soft law norms, frankly. Uh, it was disbanded in the early 1990s. What was replaced, uh, the, late, the, the, the next great effort in terms of regulating transnational corporations and human rights was the norms on transnational corporations and other, uh, it's got a long name, but the norms, the UN norms. They were drafted in a subcommission of the UN Human Rights Commission uh, in the late 1990s, early 2000s. It was passed by the subcommission and for the first time, it, those, these draft norms was going to place direct legal obligations on companies to abide and respect human rights. Um, that didn't make it out of subcommittee. The Human Rights Commission rejected it out of hand, never, never saw the light of day. So they are the draft norms. Um, that was in 2003 that they were rejected. Um, in the meantime, on the soft law front, Kofi Annan, the UN Secretary General at the time, went to the most democratic of all places, the World Economic Forum in Davos in 1999, and said, we need a new global compact between government, civil society, and business to solve the world's challenges. Um, and they took up that challenge. And a few months later, the United Nations Global Compact, a list of what was nine, now 10, sort of the 10 commandments of responsible business were established. And that remains today the world's largest social responsibility, soft law initiative. Uh, over 10,000 companies have signed up from a variety of, of, of countries. But on the hard law front, what do we do? The norms died 
Inc. subcommittee. So the Secretary General actually appointed the, the architect of the Global Compact to figure out a way out of this mess. What is business's relationship with human rights? So Professor John Ruggie from Harvard got appointed first for three years and then for six years. Uh, he had, and his mandate was to work out what is the relationship between businesses and human rights. Okay, so uh, again, I'll try and leave my politics out of it. The first three years of his mandate, he came up with three words. There you go, I've already injected a little bit of my politics. <laughs> yeah. But um, um, he came up with a three word framework, uh, protect, respect and remedy framework. States have a duty to protect human rights. Companies ha should respect human rights. Notice the change in language. And all victims of human rights should have access to remedy. Protect, states must protect. Companies should respect. And victims should have access to remedy. Protect, respect, remedy framework. Again, I'm sorry if I'm lecturing, but I sense that a few folks in the room have not heard of this. So. Um, ah, so good question. Uh, shared responsibility. Ultimately, though, it's the states that uh, have the sole legal responsibilities to protect human rights and to remediate if hum there's human rights abuses have occurred. However, that's why he got his mandate extended by three years to elaborate on these these three pillars, as they're called. What does it mean? Uh, and what does it mean in practice? And so in 2011, uh, at the end of his six year mandate, he produced and his team produced the United Nations Guiding Principles on Business and Human Rights. So this is it. This is sort of like the, uh, the Bible for uh, the relationship between business and human rights, uh, which elaborates on the protect, respect and, and remedy framework and supposed to provide guidelines. In the, that was unanimously, in contrast to the norms, which didn't make it out of the subcommission, this was unanimously supported by business entities, business industry associations, and in the Human Rights Council, the United Nations Human Rights Council. This swept through, like, psh, super easy. Again, perhaps because it did not place any direct legal obligations on companies. So there's a lot of uh, commentary about this, a lot of uh, critiques offered. Um, one of the critiques is you say remedy, but you haven't built any infrastructure um, to provide uh, remedy for corporate human rights abuses. Um, uh, the other uh, major critique is, isn't this a step backwards? Uh, haven't we just enshrined um, in an official UN document this notion that companies have no human rights responsibilities but as a matter of law. I think those are good uh, critiques. Um, anyway, the, uh, the conversation has progressed. Uh, no longer just one person. Now in its place of a special representative on business and human rights, the UN has a United Nations working group on business and human rights. Uh, primarily academics from around the world um, that are supposed to drive this agenda forward. And they're the ones that convene the United Nations Forum on Business and Human Rights and provides uh, guidance on specific issues. Um, I commend to you, they just uh, released this year a guidance on um, gendering, that's the right verb, the gendering the whole conversation around business and human rights, genderizing, I don't know, gender, uh, anyway, inserting a gender lens <laughs> into the business and human rights conversation, which I think is, again, a, a really valuable piece um, of work that they've done. Should also add that they are going to be releasing a report to the UN General Assembly next year on business and human rights in conflict-affected areas, <coughs> specifically. Um, and so there's an open call for submissions uh, as well um, uh, for that process. Okay. Um, so where are we at? Oh, so just my final, jeez, it's like 20 minutes of introductions, but I hope this is useful. <laughs> I, I don't know, please uh, tell me, and please feel free to um, interrupt and interject with, uh, with questions. I don't mean to lecture, I apologize. Um, um, in 2014, uh, so three years after the guiding principles, 
a few developing countries, Ecuador and South Africa in particular, um, said enough with this soft law. It's time we go back to the norms, hard law, yes? Um, and so they introduced a resolution in the Human Rights Council. Let's start a treaty drafting process. That was opposed by uh, most Western countries, uh, even European countries uh, that are generally perceived as forward leaning on these types of issues, opposed the establishment of a working group to draft a treaty. Uh, that was introduced in 2014 into the <coughs> Human Rights Council and indeed passed. The very next day, supported by Western developed countries, a competing, if you will, resolution was introduced that said incrementalism is the way we should proceed with this relationship between business and human rights. Step by step, let's continue to implement the soft law guiding principles. Right now then we have dual tracks at the United Nations. We have soft law, soft law, guiding principles, guiding a whole track of work around business and human rights. And we also now have the second draft of a treaty, a business and human rights treaty, uh, which you can find uh, online as well. Um, okay, that I think is a snapshot of the business and human rights universe. Um, the point of the presentation today is where's IHL in all of that? It's missing. Um, or uh, it, at least largely, I should qualify, it, it, um, it is largely missing and it doesn't have the prominence that it deserves. What do I mean by that? Uh, well, um, um, let me look at my random notes. Um, Firstly, the, the guiding principles themselves, as I said, tell us we should be prioritising conflict-affected areas. Um, businesses, when they want to respect human rights, should prioritise their impacts there. And yet, when in other, the commentaries to these guiding principles, which are part and parcel of the guiding principles, IHL is mentioned once. Um, it's mentioned uh, as uh, that states should also um, in, ensure respect for, it's in commentary principle 12, that, uh, um, that, that states should ensure that businesses not just respect the major human rights treaties, but where appropriate, international humanitarian law. Okay, good, it's included. Um, I understand there might be some disciplinary headaches of justifications as why IHL was not included in a human rights instrument, but it is there. Uh, as, as, as so the guiding principles tell us that we should be um, um, incorporating IHL into the conversation. And yet, it's, it's largely absent from uh, the, the instruments that are to have been developed by academics and by civil society um, to help businesses understand what is what are their human rights obligations, even in conflict-affected areas? IHL might, is given short shrift. Even, for example, the International Committee of the Red Cross have an academic journal that they publish. They published a special edition a few years ago about business and human rights. You would think the custodians of IHL might make a fair bit about IHL. They don't. It's mentioned but rather superficially in, 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 in those articles. And a few years ago, Simon Chesterman, a uh, scholar, I believe, Austra of Australian extraction, I think now in Singapore, um, bemoaned the fact that IHL is not really incorporated into the business and human rights conversation. He says, why aren't we looking more at this? And I think that question remains to this day. So if you have a look at, for example, the Danish Institute of Human Rights and many other civil society organisations have produced guidance material for businesses. Uh, how do you conduct human rights impact assessments? How do you conduct human rights due diligence? Uh, which is the guiding principle say, how do businesses respect human rights? They should do what's called human rights due diligence. They should investigate what are their human rights impacts 
uh, and they should implement policies uh, and capabilities internally to make sure that those impacts are minimised. And perhaps they might even need to pull back from certain investments if they can't mitigate those human rights risks. They've even produced, these, there's materials out there uh, produced by academics and civil society uh, also for guidance in conflict affected areas. And still, in my opinion, IHL is neglected. They still take a human rights lens. Um, this is problematic, I think. Um, the treaty that I mentioned, the draft treaty, um, again, doubles down and says that we should be prioritising operations and business impacts in conflict affected areas. However, the scope of the treaty does not include IHL. The scope of the treaty is all human rights. No longer, no, no mention of IHL there in the, in the scope of the treaty. Um, let me give you a few um, examples. So um, let me give you two. Uh, one from civil society and one a government um, civil society multi-stakeholder initiative. So first, civil society. The ICRC, the International Committee of the Red Cross, and DCAF, uh, they just changed their name. They used to be just DCAF, and now they're... Uh, sorry, uh, DCAF, sorry. Democratic Control of Armed Forces. Uh, uh, was DCAF, uh, a Geneva-based institution. They're about um, effective, responsible governance of security forces, be they private or public. Uh, DCAF and ICRC, lots of acronyms, they got <coughs> together uh, a few years back and wrote a five, six hundred page booklet called, um, a toolkit called Addressing Security and Human Rights Challenges in Complex Environments. It's gone through many editions. Um, and again, this is supposed to be a practical guidance toolkit, it's in the name, uh, for companies. Uh, and yet, IHL is neglected um, as a way to frame the conversation, a way to frame business responsibilities, but even in terms of risks to business, IHL is neglected, which I think is problematic. Um, so for example, um, it lists 64, this toolkit lists 64, quote, real life security and human rights challenges that may be confronted by businesses in the field. Think mining company wants to hire private security guards to protect their billion dollar copper mine in the Democratic Republic of Congo. Yeah, um, so this might be some security challenges that present itself in that complex operating environment. Um, that a company that hires people with guns, with lethal force to protect their corporate assets might want to be mindful of. Not one of those 64 real life security and human rights challenges refer to IHL or the laws of armed conflict. Problematic, in my opinion. Also, um, another, perhaps the, the largest initiative or um, in terms of security and human rights, which is where a lot of people think of, think of as IHL relevant, is uh, a 2000 initiative called the Voluntary Principles on Security and Human Rights. This is a collaboration between some leading Western countries, governments, companies and civil society to come together and work out well, what are the best practices, best practice principles for engaging security forces, uh, be they public or private. When we go into Congo and we have to sign a memorandum of understanding with the Congolese government, what should we put into that memorandum of understanding? Um, how should we relate even to public security forces? Should we be making demands on them to respect human rights? So IHL is actually in there. Um, it's in the principles, um, in the voluntary principles. And yet, how are the principles referred to? The voluntary principles on security and human rights. So you have to dig, dig into sort of the um, intricacies of it to understand that the commitment also it includes a business obligation to respect not just human rights and IHL. Wait, can I interrupt? Because yeah, I please. Okay, please, now. I'll drink. Is it, is you it that talk. deliberate? Is it, is, is it part of a larger 
uh, human rights uh, uh, approach now to conflicts and uh, trying to uh, bury, I would say, IHL uh, for and limit IHL uh, uh, as much as possible because uh, we want to inject more human rights law into the conflict. There's still all these discussions that we have on starting for the, the what is the uh, Lex Specialis uh, issue uh, and how to interpret Lex Specialis as narrow as possible uh, as some people claim uh, going to better norms that we have uh, to protect human rights and proportionality under human rights law is different than proportionality under IHL so isn't that deliberate uh, uh, action and so that's uh, that's one question I had, and yeah. the other one is said the, the the states objected to uh, such a, uh, such a, such new norms, and uh, oh, that, yeah. and the question is why. And if I was a state, I would say there is enough NGO non-state actors already uh, playing in the international law arena, and maybe it's too much for us to deal with with every. Uh, direct, but putting when you put it as the obligation, you you actually make the uh, the uh, the firms and the the business uh, corporations as um, partners to that uh, legal uh, uh, um, so legal legal status. They have a legal status once you have uh, so. Maybe it's um, states are saying for themselves. We have both states and human rights uh, organizations. So for the states parties, I would say, hey, that's enough uh, complication for us. Uh, the best way is to give to put responsibility on the states, and the states should be the ones who regulate. And and uh, uh, if it's not the state that you're operating in, so it's easier to put it on the state when you're. When you're the when you come from, uh, criminalize things in that state. So if you're doing human rights, if you're breaching human rights law mm. in another, maybe you should be criminalized in your own state. You say we'll deal with it. Mm. Uh, we don't need other players here as a direct responsibility. You can put the responsibility on the state, and the state will put it down, uh, forward. And the IHL, as I said, is something that the human rights. Uh, Human rights uh, people will say, "Okay, it's, it's all deliberate. We don't want IHL as part of it." Okay. Two issues. So, I, yeah, I, yeah. I, I wait, 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 Jonathan, just yeah, yeah. One. Uh, Harlan, yeah, good. <coughs> I want to go one step back in a way. Yep. Uh, what kind of IHL obligations do you want to put on companies? Because if it's within conduct of hostilities, conduct of hostilities covers almost everything uh, we need. The question is, what outside of conduct of hostilities types of obligations would you want to put on companies in conflict areas? Okay, so I, I believe it or not, was going to get to that. So I, I so thank you. To so one step forward. Yeah, no. So <laughs> I think, but you, you touch on, I think also part of an answer, if I may. So. IHL provides obligations to companies, like human rights, and also protections, um, as we know. Uh, IHL provides protections to corporate assets, to corporate employees, uh, their civilians, unless they're engaged in hostilities. Uh, that is a, an important piece of legal information to share with businesses, in my opinion. Uh, but we'll get to the obligations uh, I I in a second. Um, so, Robert, so um, the norms. I wrote down why did the states object, basically, was if I could, you know. Um, the states objected not, I don't think, it, well, obviously there's multiple different um, perspectives on why the norms were, um, were unsuccessful and even now why most Western countries oppose a binding treaty. Um, but I guess a cynical perspective, but one that I think has a bit of currency, is that developed countries don't want their companies to have to operate with one hand tied behind their back. Uh, number one. Number two, it was also, I think, a more um, conceptual 
critique of the norms and of the treaty. Human rights should be the responsibility, the legal obligation of states. That that's the social contract between the state, the government that governs the, its citizens. Um, so that is the appropriate um, addressee for human rights responsibilities. Businesses have no such sort of social contract with mm -hmm. citizens. So why should we, um, A, minimize our sovereignty, if in a way, diminish exactly. our sovereign sovereignty? Yeah, and, right. And then there's also the whole issue of the privatization of human rights as well, which is perhaps an even more conceptual uh, problem with uh, binding norms of, of human rights and the whole risk of corporate capture and turning human rights compliance into a, another risk management, corporate risk management process, which actually has been borne out in, in several contexts. Um, so that's a little response, but we can continue talking. Um, and so the, but I agree that IHL might, that might be minimized deliberately. Um, I, I, I agree with that. Um, for, for, for sellability, for, 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 look, for look currency. At the, look at the example you gave about uh, the uh, carrying guns and weapons to yeah. protect it. It's exactly what you, you want would not like to have uh, a guard in the mining uh, uh, facility yeah. operating I under IHL norms or uh, targeting better like self-defense when uh, and only self-defense uh. very uh, in, in the more IHL or like criminal uh, right. law. You uh, would like them operating under an IHL like maybe, uh, No, I the you rights. don't, I think you want the more restricted rights. So use of say, You would like to say, okay, you don't want more players shooting all over. It's just those who have to carry guns in that uh, conflict inflicted uh, area, let mi let minimize the, the powers that they have and only use weapons in cases of self defense and the the, the same the, the uh, only the extreme most extreme cases that. Uh, Okay. By the way, I would say about the, the countries and the cynical way that yeah. much of the businesses, uh, going back to the other uh, point that you gave, and I, I love cynical uh, okay, approaches good. because it's usually true, <laughs> uh, most of the uh, business countries uh, are uh, doing in uh, third countries uh, uh, in other uh, um, conflict inflicted areas is selling weapons. They don't do it by themselves. They have con they have weapon uh, they have uh, companies uh, this is the big <coughs> business okay it's uh, i don't know it's it's much bigger i think than the even the mining uh, which is uh, stands for itself no no question about that but most uh, business that goes with these areas is selling arms okay. and it's not done it's tr uh, straightforward this right. country is by right. uh, companies that uh, are pushing the they, they won't, don't want the those companies being put under more um, restrictions because right. it's not good for their economy, right. and it's, uh, they would say, if I don't, right. if I can sell the weapons for that, for the, uh, why shouldn't my right. the, and the, uh, the other organizations that are the, the other corporations? Yeah. That's the cynical. And, and that's and that's, uh, that's response the, to that's lots of yeah, corporate regulation in general, um, but but a treaty that is universal universally applicable might address that but anyway and <laughs> this is it, won't have to let, let me <laughs> let, let me push forward a little but i think you raised some some really good issues which i'm happy to, to circle back to but uh, i guess in response a little to to the to the to the points uh especially especially you know you know uh, sort of asks you know what's the practical difference if you will between a human rights lens and an ihl lens wouldn't we prefer them to operate under a human rights lens well, let me again remind you that the human rights lens without IHL is just companies should respect human rights. They don't have any binding legal obligations under human rights law. Okay, what does it do, Mr. Exactly. <laughs> no, exactly. Sorry, I don't mean to be <laughs> trite. What? That's the point, right? What does it mean to respect? So the guiding principles sort of try and elaborate on that, but the primary way that companies should respect human rights is by conducting human rights due diligence. 
uh, which again goes to the whole question then of corporate capture and reducing respect for human rights to a simple corporate sort of checklist sort of process. What is human rights due diligence is, uh, again, uh, there's some work fleshing it out, but there's no one right way to do it. But essentially, identify what are the human rights uh, the human rights uh, norms that sh that are relevant to your business. Assess what I what are your business's impacts on those human rights. Um, so you know, uh, slave labour is uh, is uh, child labour very popular right now in Australia. That came out wrong, uh, but we uh, <laughs> we have a modern slavery legislation just introduced in Australia. It's going to be uh, live in 2020. So for the first time, companies over a certain size have to report <coughs> on any quote modern slavery in their supply chains. So now there are companies including abroad in their supply chains, including abroad. Um, so the companies are now investigating the I international labor con uh, organization conventions, and uh, it's. It, no, I but think it's it's that the question is, it, should it be like exactly like the same, not only in this aspect, so in everything? That, uh, uh, yes. So okay. So okay. So we're jumping around a bit, and I want to get to IHL, but uh, <laughs> business and human rights. So so if you think that's good, so the UK has a modern slavery. Act, which has been in force now for a four, four or five years now, which is even stronger because, as excuse me, uh, Ronen uh, said before, asked about remedy. Who does remedy? So one of the issues with our modern slavery legislation is there's no enforcement mechanism, mm -hmm. um, or at least if you if we want to be generous, the theory of the case is that market forces will um, make change in corporate practices. But all companies are required to do is publish the report. That's it. There's no follow-up. There's no... Um, the UK has slightly better enforcement. But even better, now a few European jurisdictions are talking about mandatory human rights due diligence. Not just on modern slavery, but far broader on human rights writ large. Uh, and, and for it to be mandatory. Um, there's talk about that example in Switzerland but on the books right now current law is uh, which is perhaps the, the biggest highest profile piece of law around business and human rights is the French um, I don't speak French so I'm going to butcher the uh, I'll just say it in English the, <laughs> the, the duty of vigilance law so not just due diligence to report but a more proactive a company in France that has, I think it's 5,000 staff in, in France, uh, have to prepare annually a report of how they are not, not just about the presence of human rights impacts in, this, in their supply chain, but what are they doing to remediate? Mm -hmm. how, what are they doing to respond to those human rights uh, impacts? Um, so that's perhaps the biggest thing in the world in, in the world of legislation, uh, business and human rights legislation. I can't even remember how we got onto this. <laughs> um, let me get back to IHL, please. Yeah. Um, so why should a company care about IHL? Is essentially what you guys are saying, uh, asking. I think isn't human rights enough? So let me throw out a few lines. Why? Um, so, uh, human rights law, there are no direct corporate obligations under human rights law. Arguably, IHL uh, places legal responsibilities on any actor, be it a state or a non-state actor, in armed conflict. We don't have to create new treaty. We don't have to um, push the envelope to suggest that companies and corporate, um, uh, corporate entities and uh, corporate employees, corporate agents, corporate staff are bound by the norms of IHL, of international humanitarian law. Uh, secondly, uh, human rights is derogable. IHL is not. IHL is lex specialis. And so I appreciate that there are some that are diminishing uh, and, and sort of arguing human rights is a better framework. Okay, 
Uh, but how about this as an argument that international humanitarian law, the laws of war were created to regulate conduct during times of conflict. It, it is not just lex specialis in a sort of arcane legal sense, but in a very deliberate sense. What are the norms of behaviour? Uh, what are the ethical, what are the responsible norms of behaviour in times of armed conflict? And again, they're addressed to states, but explicitly to non-state actors as well. Um, so we shouldn't ignore them, I don't think. In, in fact, I would say we should be giving them um, greater significance. Um, um, I also think that there's IHL can provide some operational guidance. Actually, kind of what you guys were talking about before, about self-defense. I think IHL norms, and especially the... Ju Jurisprudence is a you know big word, but the jurisprudence, but also the practical guidance that has been developed over the years by the likes of the Red Cross with militaries um, to implement IHL is really robust um, and is transferable also and relevant to a business context. Less so, I think, when we talk about how do we respect human rights as a business. So, you know, Robert, you mentioned proportionality. So the principles of IHL, you know, necessity, distinction, proportionality, I'm probably missing a few, but, you know. Uh, it depends who you ask. Yeah, yeah, it's true. Everyone has different answers. It's true. Chivalry, uh, whatever, no, and others. So, uh, but, okay, it but, depends which book you open. It at it's now. true. But, 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 you know, enshrined in the Geneva Conventions, you know, uh, humanity, you know, yeah, humanity so. you know, proportionality, military necessity, distinguishing between civilians and combatants at all times. I think these principles are equally applicable in a business context, and not only that, but provide practical guidance to a business in how to engage in a fragile or conflict-affected, conflict-prone environment, less so than human rights. IHL is, is, if you will, about how do we constrain actors' activities. I'm not, maybe I'm not framing this right. Whereas human rights is about uh, the rights of those people on the other side of the fence. Well, IHL. Human rights is respect, protect, and prevent. So it's more than just protect. Uh, have, they have their rights, their obligations upon the one that has the responsibility to so control. Agree, but companies do not have any direct legal obligations under human rights law. I'm, I'm still waiting to hear about. The, the IHL. Uh, okay. So I'm waiting for you to get there. Okay. Well, stay quiet. Stop it, <laughs> um, um, okay. So, so, um, uh, okay. You don't have to jump thoughts. over. Yeah, just... no, it's all good. Um, all in your course. Um, yeah. You should have told us to wait until we finish. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, Um, yeah, no, so, so, you know, so, so I can't get beyond this because uh, it's troubling me. It's essentially, <laughs> IHL is addressed to individuals. So any individual that has active participation, again, we can, I don't have the Geneva Conventions here, but uh, any individual that is actively uh, participating in hostilities are bound by the Geneva Conventions. <coughs> um, so we uh, don't need new law. In f exactly. In fact, think about it, the additional protocol two of 1977 of the Geneva Conventions explicitly extends uh, IHL to non-state actors. Yeah. Okay, can I leave it there? Well, I, I'm oh, still, I want to know which norms Okay, you okay, okay. Yeah, 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 fine, <laughs> fine, fine, fine. But, but, but that it's the law uh, in conflict affected areas uh, is uh, and applicable to businesses as non-state actors, I think, is uh, established. So, what are the norms that are relevant for businesses? Uh, are the IHL norms relevant for businesses? Okay, so protection of civilians, um, I think, is is uh, the, the obvious one. Um, um, another one, protection of private pop property, the prohibition on pillage. Um, Another important one, um, preventing widespread, the pro prohibition on uh, widespread environmental damage 
also, uh, which is currently before yeah. the International Law Commission, by the way, for greater elaboration, um, I think is relevant to businesses. Um, and uh, trading weapons, another. And he, let me, for my final one, let me also highlight something that I think is specific to Israel-Palestine and also a great practical difference between human rights and humanitarian law, namely occupation. Uh, in IHL, there's a whole set of rules around belligerent or military occupation. So not active, active hostilities, but uh, the IHL applies to situations of occupation. Under that, there are also other rules around preservation of natural resources of the occupied territory, um, uh, not transferring populations into or out of occupied territories. Um, and so let's get, let's get specific. Israel, Palestine, most international legal scholars suggest that, uh, well, believe, uh, argue, contend, <laughs> Uh, I need to be careful with my words. I don't mean to be political on the non-political issues, but um, uh, but West Bank is no true. Uh, there, is, there is belligerent yeah. occupation in the West Bank. Right, West Bank, and, and <laughs> let's leave yeah. Gaza yeah. for the time political. being. But I would argue that both West Bank and Gaza, uh, the the laws of occupation but still th apply. That's the mainstream opinion in the international community. I think Thank you. Gaza opinions are divided. No, in Gaza, the international community says occupied. But there are some uh, yeah. dissenting yeah. opinions. Well, Scholars, they have yeah, yeah. There's what, some, yeah. but it comes down to effective politics. control, yeah. I think. Exactly. And anyway, well, let, let's let's next seminar. Um, so, so, so one of the big things about these uh, no IHL norms that I've spoken about, companies have actually already been pursued for failing to live up to them, um, for failing to live up to them. Which is again, I think, a one practical difference, and I'll come back to occupation in a second. But one big, great practical difference between human rights and IHL, and why we should, um, um, why businesses should care about IHL norms, and why we as civil society should be also sharing that that message. Um, the liabilities, the enforcement regimes, the access to remedy when it comes to IHL. Um, is more robust than human rights violations. Now, before you jump down my throat, I agree, it's nowhere near where it needs to be. I agree, I agree, I agree. But that's the argument, the response for most international law violations, human rights, IHL, refugee law, whatever, that there aren't robust enforcement mechanisms. My argument is that there are, in a, in a um, marginal way, in a, um, in a um, anyway, in a comparative way, better, um, more robust, wider number of accountability pathways for IHL violations of companies than human rights violations as it currently stands. Let me give you some historical examples. Um, Robert, you mentioned arms, arms transfer. A Dutch businessman was convicted and he's sitting in jail uh, for supplying uh, chemical uh, precursors to chemical weapons to the Saddam Hussein regime. He knew or ought to have known how those weapons were going to be used and therefore was held to be complicit in the war crimes when Saddam Hussein dropped that mustard gas on uh, the Kurds. In was, 1988. Uh, uh, charged, I guess, under uh, domestic law, right. not by uh, because he was, he was assisting uh, murder. That's, uh, that's the idea. Right. So, so this is, but so this gets to the the pathways, the accountability pathways. Many states around the world have uh, a signed up to the Rome Statute of the International Criminal Court, which makes grave violations of international humanitarian law a war crime prosecutable at the ICC, but as part and parcel of signing up to the Rome Statute, or some even that haven't, they've also domesticated international war crimes. It's a requirement. <coughs> Complementarity. No, yeah. Under the Rome Statute. Under you the Rome Statute. You sign it in your uh, ratified. Yeah, you you're supposed to. Yeah. Some haven't, but even some, some states that haven't signed up to the Rome Statute mm -hmm. have recognised uh, the, have criminalized war crimes 
uh, and grave violations of IHL in their domestic courts. Um, it's harder to find um, grave violations of human rights abuses in a uh, country's criminal codes. Um, so for example, in the Australian Criminal Code, what we did when we signed up to the Rome Statute, um, we, oh, so hang on, let me back up. The ICC's jurisdiction does not cover companies. I thought I was gonna get that objection uh, earlier. Um, the International Criminal Court can't prosecute companies per se, but they can prosecute company executives, company security officers, absolutely. And in fact, the prosecutors, Ocampo and Bensuda, the two prosecutors we've had so far at the ICC, have acknowledged that corporate related war crimes is an area of focus, and they should be focusing and even bringing prosecutions in, in regard to those types of um, criminal acts. To date, there has been no prosecutions at the ICC of corporate actors. At the ICTR, the International Criminal Tribunal for Rwanda, there, had, there was the, the famous radio case. There was a radio owner, radio DJ that um, incited to genocide by playing music. Uh, an amazing case. Um, also at the, um, uh, the Hariri Tribunal up in Lebanon, the Special Tribunal for Lebanon, um, they held a TV station in contempt of court. Uh, again, the company itself was held in contempt by a, a hybrid international, domestic, international criminal tribunal. Who well, adopted the Lebanese law in that, uh, for that and case? I said hybrid, but yeah, yeah but okay. still, okay, you know, yeah. there's some advances yeah. even on holding companies accountable. And um, in terms of international, let's go back and look at Nuremberg. Uh, so one of my favorite little tangents in my research yeah. was going back to back to Nuremberg and seeing how were German companies treated and prosecuted for these most heinous of crimes. Um, in fact, you know, many scholars talk about Nuremberg as the founding or the great birth of, of international criminal law. We didn't have the Geneva Conventions yet, but um, uh, were companies held accountable at Nuremberg? Well, I've got a great article about it. It depends on your perspective, uh, uh, historical lens. Um, about 40 plus corporate executives were held, were tried uh, during the Nuremberg era. Many were found guilty. Uh, the largest companies were dissolved, or at least that was the plan. They were split into smaller companies and a few years later those smaller companies were as large as the, their predecessor companies. Um, all the ex corporate executives that were convicted at Nuremberg were released within, I think, seven years as well. Politics, yeah. Um, um, the new Cold War had to be fought. Um, um, but, but anyway, that's a tangent. Um, but uh, that was a big tangent. But domestically, that's where I was going. Australian Criminal Code, we did not incorporate the jurisdictional constraints of the Rome Statute. So currently, under Australian law, and this is similar to, uh, if you will, I guess, universal jurisdiction provisions in other states, uh, under the Australian Criminal Code, uh, any company or individual can be prosecuted for war crimes. Um, to me, that is uh, a really interesting pathway. It's never been tested. There are obviously some hurdles. Uh, namely, if you want to do a war crimes prosecution in Australia, um, you need the Attorney General's approval. That could be, a, uh, you know, a slight pr uh, hurdle. But then again, you could uh, imagine a case of corporate, um, you know, atrocities that is, you know, caught on YouTube, that is well documented. You know, what Attorney General who's up for re-election in a few months would turn that down perhaps, you know, there, there might be political flack for turning down such a prosecution as well. It, it's just one example. There are both international and domestic pathways for prosecuting IHL violations. Not only that, but there's also civil pathways. So not just criminal prosecutions, but civil litigation attempts. Um, so um, uh, if you have a look at, uh, well, Lafarge Holcim, one of the largest cement manufacturers on the planet, uh, 
is currently charged for bribing ISIS in Syria. Uh, French court. Uh, a, um, uh, how is that an actual violation? So that was in a conflict zone. Uh, I believe officially they were... Um, that I, 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 I haven't read the indictment, but uh, I believe they've been indicted on complicity in crimes against humanity and war crimes committed by the ISIS that they helped um, uh, bribe. So the bribery was complicity. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, uh, yeah. Um, also, BNP Polybus, uh, one of the largest banks in France, uh, one of the largest banks in the world, um, is currently uh, facing criminal as well as, I believe, civil prosecution, uh, civil litigation for their complicity in the genocide in Darfur. Uh, in the early 2000s, the US Department of, of, of Justice referred to them as sort of the state bank of, of Sudan. They were helping President Bashir um, fund and prosecute um, multiple conflicts in Darfur and in South Sudan. BNP Palibas is being held liable, is being held accountable before courts of law. Um, Agor Halayas, a Swiss gold refinery, a gold refining company, was also uh, investigated. Uh, in the end, uh, charges were dropped. But they, the Swiss, uh, were investigating them for complicity in war crimes in Central Africa. Um, here, let's now talk Israel Palestine a bit and occupation, go back to that. I would contend, but I'd be interested to hear your opinions, that arguably, you could be violating, as a company, you could be violating IHL without violating human rights. And the biggest example I can think of is the settlements, Israeli settlements in the West Bank. According to one theory, any assistance enabling or facilitation of the settlement enterprise, provision of electricity, provision of water, building, I don't know, a light rail, to uh, Israeli settlements in East Jerusalem is tantamount to a war crime. I'm not sure that building a light rail track to East Jerusalem is a violation of human rights. Or at the very least, it's a little bit more circuitous to identify human rights that are being breached by the provision of electricity to an Israeli settlement, the provision of transport infrastructure or water to, a, to an Israeli settlement. Uh, there might be human rights violations that, that occur as a result, but the, 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 an argument is that the mere laying of light rail tracks into East Jerusalem is itself complicity in a violation of IHL and is essentially a war crime. But aren't you taking the IHL violation, moving towards to the ICC type of violation that goes directly or indirectly support and then you're going and invading or support so we're in that criminal violation I'm muddling accountability with the norms that, that, that have been violated but the norms themselves are IHL norms well it's I see of actually uh, in that case because we are talking indirectly support uh, so, so the method of the mode of accountability I agree is international criminal law However, the norm is laws of occupation, Geneva Conventions. The, the and, and they're linked, yeah? I mean, uh, they're, they're, link, they're linked. They're transfer. Um, so you can't transfer populations into occupied territory. Um, you cannot use uh, natural resources uh, unless for the benefit of the, um, the, the citizens of the occupied territory. There's a, a case against uh, a quarry in the West Bank. Uh, owned by a German quarrying company called Heidelberg Cement. Uh, Alstom the, was one of the partners in the, um, uh, what do you call it, the, uh, the cooperative, no, the, uh, the joint venture that built the Jerusalem light rail. Um, they were pursued in European courts for their involvement. Alstom, no, Veolia sold yeah. Violi both yeah. of them were pursued. I believe Violia sold their share of the joint venture to Dunn, an Israeli company, public transport company. And Alstom continued, fought the charges, 
but has also announced that they're no longer going to be involved in building the light rail in, Jer in Jerusalem. Um, there was a Dutch water company that was going to be involved in building a wastewater treatment plant in East Jerusalem. Um, they were pressured, they were presented with facts that this is an IHL violation because you'd be helping the settlement enterprise. Um, the response was, no, but we're just helping everybody in East Jerusalem uh, treat the wastewater which is currently flowing through streets. Isn't this a good thing? Ultimately, they pulled out of that project because the risk, uh, again, not a human rights law risk, but an IHL law risk was too great for them. Um, Cisco is being pursued uh, in, uh, under the Alien Tort Statute in the United States for their involvement in what's called the Golden Shield, uh, one of the um, Chinese companies, Chinese government's uh, efforts to control their population. Um, there are tech companies that, um, uh, that are involved, for example, Hewlett Packard is involved in the, uh, the checkpoints between the human rights, the Chinese issue. No, it's not an um, They control their own population. Right, you know? right. No, so, but I think there was, there was, there's some aspects of the, the litigation are around also their involvement in Tibet, uh, which some might argue. Okay. Anyway, is an also occupation. The, but but, but the question is, don't you confuse political uh, pressure economical decisions by the companies due to PR with acknowledgement of uh, legal and IHL obligations. It goes together, doesn't it? Well, yeah. necessarily, yes. even if I'm not to. violating anything, but I think PR uh, will be oh. perceived yeah, as problematic. But, but being singled as someone who's violating IHL has some very bad PR consequences. Um. Well, not necessarily. It yeah. is. Well, if it yeah. is on its own, but not necessarily. But you know, those if we cases get, if the business based complies on IHL. with IHL, be it for PR, because they're yeah. ethical, because they've been prosecuted before. Yeah. But does, does it matter? Yeah. Yeah. Ultimately, the goal is no. is okay. IHL well, respect. Because we are talking about IHL obligations towards the company, so I do care if there are backing down because of PR or they're backing down because they think they have a legal obligation to do so. But if, if, if they thought that this is complete nonsense, that they have no um, IHL obligation at all, they would brush it off, right? Because no. the PR would not have been as... No, if I'm going to lose a lot of money because of but PR, losing, but the more PR than I'm going to gain from that... With the IHL violation, you have bad PR because you're being accused of violating right. IHL. If the, if the accusation is without any um, basis, you will you will make an argument. I mean, you, you can argue against it. I can, but especially in today's media, where it's much easier to go away from the argument than to have the fight. And I, I'm not saying that there aren't IHL obligations in in that context. I'm just saying that the 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 decision of the company companies are very straightforward. Money makes okay. decisions. So that's, that's fine. fine. That's but fine. it doesn't mean but right that now, they IHL. break it down because of the IHL reasoning and not just because of no, the that's PR fine. reasoning. So I'm not trying to turn, turn a for-profit company into something it's not. Understand that it's mo a company's motivations is to make money. By law. That's okay. Yeah. It's a for-profit company. I mean, we can have another conversation about you know corporate form and, and, and all the rest. Um, so at the end of the day, the biggest lever for responsible business conduct in any context, climate change, environmental protection, human rights, or IHL, is going to be the bottom line, right? Yeah. That's fine with me. Uh, and that's why I think also the accountability side, and why I mentioned these actual court cases, is actually really important to convey um, that uh, because the risk is both foreseeable at possible, likely, and large um, uh, when it comes to IHL violations over, I think, human rights violations. It's all relative, <laughs> and I'm not in any way trying to diminish, by the way, human rights law. I'm just simply saying IHL is missing, is complementary, and is a value add to the conversation. 
Um, let me give you another example. Airbnb mm -hmm. in the settlements. Yeah. Again, I'm not sure how familiar you guys are. Yeah, with, of course. Yeah. yeah. So Airbnb um, um, was was pressured. Why? Again, not in particular for human rights, specific human rights violations, but for participating in the Israeli settlement enterprise by listing things on their website. Listing and they, they back and they returned back because right. of other reasons. They so, they, so they withdrew yeah. and then they returned after the anti-BDS movement mm -hmm. threatened or I think actually pursued litigation pursued, pursued in American yeah, courts. Yeah. So I believe, and you guys might know better, but I believe they're back with their listings in um, occupied uh, Palestinian territories. However, they have announced that all profits from those listings will be donated to charity. I believe that's their current corporate stance. <laughs> anyway, but I, why I mentioned Airbnb, and I also wanted to mention SodaStream, mm -hmm. which I think is another case study. Now we're jumping, I think, to, to one of my, my areas of inquiry or, that I would love your opinions on is, is is IHL a better frame or not? Or is it, um, is it still lacking the appropriate framework when we talk about what is a responsible business occupying, uh, uh, operating in Israel-Palestine? So in other words, uh, let me, let me uh, rephrase. Should we be talking more about businesses' obligations to peace building and responsibilities to resolving the armed conflict that they're operating in, or is it okay to keep having these compliance frameworks, essentially, right? I'm just adding IHL to it, to the human rights compliance framework. Should we be talking about business for peace, not business for IHL? Um, I think I want to go back to try to, to answer that. I don't have an answer to the question, but I want to go back to a, a point that you, that you made in the introduction, which I thought was very interesting, about, um, about colonialism and how this reflects, this whole uh, discourse reflects this, this um, concern that transnational corporations are a form of new colonialism or post-colonialism. And I kept thinking to myself uh, during uh, 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 your lecture about how this initial concern has in affected the discourse and the, the choice you know, to use human rights, the human rights framework and not IHL. Because I'm wondering to myself, and you know, in these uh, examples that you give and in, now in your question now, whether um, part of this, this, this policy doesn't stem exactly from the concern that if I'm coming into a country and I'm trying to you know, make an impact that you know, affects policy, and I'm now uh, held responsible as a private actor for all kinds of human, you know, um, uh, uh, international law violations made by the state. Is this not, in effect, some sort of form of post-colonialism? Because I'm right. coming in right and enforcing my values. Right. And there is something easier about the human rights framework that's more sort of, I guess, focused on individual rights and might maybe, mm. you know, uh, you know, uh, um, give states a way out. So now that you're talking about. For instance, corporations and you know and building peace, it all sounds really great. But, but I'm asking myself whether this right. would not be a concern for, you know, like Western or developed countries coming in and sort of, yeah. you know, pouring their values uh, right. into a into a different state. Is right. this not part of the right. I don't know, uh, policy, right. the reason for this policy? Yeah, that's very good um, comments. Thank you. Um so 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 I think it's a fear, yes. Um, not just that, but also corporate capture. So not just neo-colonialism, but also this fear of corporate capture. However, I would say that human rights, you have more problems mm. with fears of neo-colonialism right. than IHL. Why? Uh, why? Well, there's this whole notion, the whole conversation about the universal, the, oh, no, excuse, yeah. me, excuse me, the universalism mm. of human rights right. uh, versus cultural relativism. Who are we to come in with our human version of human rights? Whereas IHL, again, is, you know, Geneva Conventions are essentially universally ratified, universally adopted, considered customary law, and are not as far reaching either as human rights. So especially in the context of conflict affected areas, the fact that it is time and space bound, IHL is, I think is actually more appealing or less, less um, opposed to, or less, um, Sorry, um, 
I'm, I'm thinking in Hebrew now. I think <laughs> it's too long <laughs> in the country. Um, it's not good. Right. So, um, so you're saying it's even it's even less controversial in a way. Yeah. 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 Um, that's, that's and I guess you could also make the sort of the counter argument to what I said that, for instance, in the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, I mean, if corporations if we don't hold them, hold them accountable, then aren't they actually partaking in some sort of form of colonialism? I mean, if you see the Israeli occupation of the Palestinians as you know, a form of colonialism or post-colonialism, then you can also make that argument. But I, I don't know. I mean, it just seems to me that this, that this, this concern for post-colonialism must have affected you know, the, uh, the framework in some way. I so think so. I think and it's really interesting to think about that. And in terms of business for peace, which, you know, again, I've just uh, tried to yeah. push, comes, like, it, 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 Who's peace? Right. On what terms? Right. On whose terms? Yes. Um, hugely problematic, and, and should we have businesses making these decisions? Oh, yeah, uh, problematic, but but um, it will be very easy for the Israeli occupation to work with this uh, with this kind of thinking. Oh. Business for peace. Like mm. building infrastructure in the West Bank, right? Yeah, the financial peace, right. the financial also, peace, yeah. you know, all this discourse, the economic you know, peace, yeah, all this, yeah, 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 yeah. right, like, uh, right. So this even the Prime too. Minister of Israel, uh, for at least last time I checked, Bibi, uh, is, has embraced this notion of economic peace yes. building. Of he's course. done it bring, in lieu bring of bring investors in, right? Bring, you know, he's done it as a replacement of political peace building, um, and and it's also why in this context I think economic peace building has a bad name. Yeah. Um, um, but everyone, I think, that looks at conflicts and conflict resolution acknowledges that developing economies um, is vitally important to resolve conflicts, to prevent recidivism, re return to, to violence. So economic peace building has to be a part of the resolution of this conflict and any other. And so when we talk about economic peace building, Tuchless, brass tin tax, we're talking about business. Um, so, uh, again, uh, I guess why I bring that up is because there are folks, a lot of the people in the business and human rights discourse are promoting litigation, and, and especially in, in terms of the Israeli Palestinian context, are promoting divestment. So, I think uh, Ranen, no, right. it's. All in. Sorry, Safa Oren um, mentioned, you know, well, what does it mean to respect human rights? And I said human rights due diligence. Yeah, it was how. So companies should adopt policies to work out what their human rights impacts are, if they can mitigate them, how do they mitigate them. But at the end of the day, the advice from the wise men and women of the world is if you cannot mitigate human rights impacts, maybe you should divest. Right? And in the context of Israel, Palestine, you certainly have that, you have different forms of that. Um, and I'm wondering here, I'm sitting here, uh, having spoken to some wise people here on the ground, wondering, well, if, is that the best thing for the people here? In the abstract, it's nice. Human rights, due diligence, if you can't, you know, um, protect human rights in a broad sense, IHL violations too, then maybe you should divest. In, in an abstract, that makes sense. But what of SodaStream leaving Amal Adomin, right? 600 plus Palestinians no longer have a salary. Um, my understanding um, from my interactions with people is that the intent behind their Israeli-Palestinian sort of cooperation was genuine. It was premised from a sort of an ethical basis by the founders and the leaders of the company. Um, should we celebrate that or should we condemn it? I guess is a more black and white way of talking. Yes, they were supporting Israeli settlements. Yes, arguably they were complicit, therefore in IHL violations and in a war crime. But, and I, I'm, I'm wondering how much emphasis to place on the butt or just be a you know a doctrinal purist in a way um anyway i don't know if you guys have thoughts about yeah. that but to no, me no, i think that's I the think one thing that i've struggled with the most over the last few uh, days talking um, to people so my, yeah my opinion is that the framework that the uh, that the uh, settlements and the occupation project the illegal the illegality of this project is the most is the strongest um, uh, argument 
uh, provided to fight to fight the occupation today, and not the human rights discourse. Because the Soda Stream is maybe one case, yes, but it can be used. The human rights framework can, can be, be used, used by Israel in so many different forms to deepen the occupation, to normalize it in so many different ways, uh, especially when they uh, it's not a um, uh, like flat occupation, it's a colonial situation when yeah. we try to push them out and grab them. Yeah. So the, it's a, the situation is getting more and more complex and we're in order to, um, to, to um, uh, 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 try to object the, op the occupation, you have to have that very strong direct argument, which is working. I think this is the only last standpoint against the, against the occupation that's working is the, the so illegality of sorry. How do you think it's working? In uh, public discourse, mainly in uh, the BD, uh, BDS. Uh, BDS movement, in um, in uh, the European. Uh, um, I think you mentioned few few cases of uh, so I think this is the the only maybe this is the only uh, arena which kind of uh, producing some kind of uh, um, um, uh, restrictions or the Israeli government is taking into account when it's dealing with what we're going to do over there like building new settlements or new. Uh, uh, industrial zones or new infrastructure is all getting into a new debate, but the debate is on the base of I I like Ill illegality, and not on the base of human rights. Because right. the human rights, but once you have set settlers right. living next door to Palestinians, the human rights issue, yeah, right. So the for example con concerning right. in infrastructure provide, it's like I mean, yeah. So uh, I, I'm not convinced. Uh, I, I'm convinced about everything you said in terms of the law of occupation being far more relevant. I mean, that's what I'm here presenting than human rights law. But I'm not convinced that it's working. I'm not convinced that this divestment in whatever guise, be it BDS or, or corporate litigation, um, is working. The occupation... I, I don't see any Israeli government policies that have, have moderated in regards to the settlements as a result. In fact, um, the vibe if I can use an Aussie term, uh, that I've, I've sensed here is that we don't care. That yes, the, the optics are not good. The, the brand of Israel abroad has been sullied. But here, has it stymied investment in Israel by, by global companies? No. Not in Israel, but in the, in the West Bank. Um, right. So the, the, but the Palestinian Authority have, have, have and the Palestinian economy have a, a sort of a pure approach, right? They, their stated policy is economic separation, is, is we will not cooperate, uh, you know, with uh, Israeli uh, businesses. Again, I can appreciate that, but I, I, I guess I just wanted to, I, I'm struggling yeah with who who's suffering from that policy in the short term and again i'm not here trying to legitimate the occupation in, in no way shape or form but um economic development of the palestinian society so too with israeli society is paramount if there is ever going to be peace here let me share my thoughts with you first of yeah. all i think you've got a point okay um, I am persuaded that the, you can actually you don't you don't really need a new guidance or manual or something like that that goes with IHL. You have to like have you have to you can like we have manuals on uh, low applicable to cyber or low. Right. Uh, you can write a manual already. It's a good idea about right. uh, what uh, a company uh, should or should uh, uh, be doing uh, uh, in uh, uh, to. Um, do it in, in light of IHL norms, and yes, there is some personal, uh, even uh, legal, uh, personal legal duties that uh, IHL is better than uh, than others in getting out to the uh, to the last person. But as you went from that corp issue, uh, when whenever you go and expand yourself to the, uh, like you got to the settlements issue, and, and then what is an IHL violation? What is a war crime in that, in that aspect? So yeah. 
that is the more um, gray, these are the more gray areas to my, to my mind because I can bring some other, I, d I don't think that any conduct of business in an occupied area um, is immediately <coughs> assisting a war crime. Because not any occupied uh, state, the settlements. That's the difference. No, no, you it's speaking about the settlements. I'm. This is why I'm starting with this yeah, uh, thing. I'm saying, okay, not every business that you're doing in an occupied area, because you went to Solar Street, for example, is immediately uh, uh, something that is uh, is going with the settlements. Now, the settlements, not everything that you're doing is helping the war or transferring a population. Israel has claims that uh, I think uh, that she's it's not transferring the population of really to Max, the, 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 and the prosecutor has the last uh, report that she's uh, published a few days ago, the ICC prosecutor, as he's asking whether subsidies and, uh, try and funding uh, is something that and, and that's a big, that's a question. It's a legal question right. whether that's enough to be a part of a war crime. Right. And so, whenever you go to that, an, an occupation is not by itself a war crime. Okay, and you yeah, won't of have it's well the legalized. It's, yeah. it's not. Uh, it's something that there is a law applicable to it because right. it was. It's not right. illegal. Right. In the, okay, it's so morally uh, right. improper, and then you can. Have all the bad things to say about it, yeah. but law is applicable to it because this yeah. is not so by itself work. Yeah. Yeah. So you're right, so you don't, not every company that trades with an occupied people in territory would do a war crime, but if right. you aid the settlers settle, okay, so no, <laughs> I guess that's, then that will be this is the if you have, there, right. If you have a country, let's go to the other... Uh, in fact, yeah, if you the, have the occupied force has a duty to maintain order and peace and whatever, and right. to keep it like... To right. Yeah, yeah, to you have a lot of duties you have to do, and if you assist, maybe you have business doing something that can assist, that uh, it's, it could be even okay. If you, like, if you're a bus company coming from, uh, and you're actually taking people from that country... But if you supply concrete to buy their homes, then right. I think it can, can be a war crime. It's a, what I'm, all I'm saying, and I'm not sure, Okay, that what I'm saying is from whenever you, um, there is some core, core issues that I fully agree with, okay, if you're actively participating in hostilities, uh, then I feel it's applicable whether you are uh, um, a soldier in, in, specific, uh, in the army or uh, a business uh, coming to sending p people uh, uh, like uh, mercenaries yeah. uh, to participate. Of course, it's uh, but uh, and on that core issue, I fully agree. And but the question, like in many other issues, is uh, I don't I don't think you should even. It's your decision, of course. You go wider and wider. That's uh, to, to to even to, to those what I call gray areas. Then it's the question. It's if it's a criminal question. At what point you could say you can go further and say every business you conduct with Israel. This is what BDS is saying. It's not saying don't conduct business with the uh, territories. Every business that you're conducting yeah. with Israel, you're actually yeah. assisting war crimes yes. to be, and that's yeah. so too far. Can, can uh, I just, uh, in, yeah. in the criminal or in the ICL yeah. or in the yeah. IHL, even uh, a perspective. Yeah. Where I, can, I, can I can I respond? So, firstly, especially because we're being recorded, I just want to go on the record that I'm not a BDS uh, <laughs> supporter, nor do I believe that support investing or operating in Israel is um, is, is is a war crime. But uh, Rob had. I got to. I got to get out of the country. Um, <laughs> and, 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 Nobody and, sees and, that. Uh, yeah, they'll get you. The one come back in. in. Yeah, it <laughs> won't be a problem. Good if your last but I know name. you all. <laughs> It's good it's your last day, maybe there's <laughs> someone to help you go no, out of no. the country at this time. No, no. Well, but no, you know, it's interesting, right, because there's a lot of business and human rights activists that are uh, opposed. And that's why I think it's also important to have these conversations with well-meaning people uh, on both sides and of non-Israelis and non-Palestinians as well, to have a, a constructive conversation, not an adversarial and a destructive one. Um, so, but Robert, can I just sort of reframe what you're saying and say, I agree that we don't know where the line of uh, complicity 
in a war crime is. Exactly. Yeah? Agree. And we need to test that, and it will be tested in the courts. But my other response is that as a, a responsible company, they don't wait for that, and they shouldn't. Companies are proactive. That's the whole point of due diligence. They have risk management processes. I would argue um, that if you have a look around, um, even investors, leading investors, uh, the Norwegian Southern Wealth Fund, uh, Pension Fund, uh, others, are no longer investing in Israeli banks. Why? Not because they're Israeli banks, but because they provide services to the Israeli settlements. Um, and they said, basically, we need to protect, mitigate any risk exposure. And so we're just not going to okay. invest in, in, those, you, in those banks. At this minute, you have left IHL and yeah, due diligence. And no, no, no. IHL was saying we're doing this is implementing thing. IHL uh, in not. a business context. I think this is exactly what it means to implement IHL in a business context. So, when, and this is what I guess my point, right? Is that if you're a military, uh, if you're in the Israeli military, you go and have training sessions about proportionality, about distinction between civilians and combatants. Um, yeah, there are there are lawyers that oversee the targeting um, in operations. Um, businesses, what does it mean to respect IHL in a business context? It means being cognizant of what the IHL rules are, how you might fall foul of it and trying to mitigate those risks. And what does it mean in the context of occupation to be a peace building uh, company? Like what, <laughs> what would you think of SodaStream doing otherwise? I'm really uh, conflicted. What do you think? I'm really conflicted uh, uh, because my, my thing is, m the way I come to international law is international law is a tool. It's not the destination, it's a tool. And so uh, uh, here in this context, the way I apply and think about international law in, in the context of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict is how does it advance us to get towards some sort of resolution of this conflict? And I agree, I totally, I'm sympathetic to this idea that any support to the Israeli settlement enterprises is, is, is wrong as a matter of law and should not be su supported. But equally, and again, I can't believe I'm going to say this because it's a bit, you know, true cliche, but I know enough Palestinians to know that they too want to put bread on the table and support their families. Um, to know that the withdrawal of a soda stream has an impact, has a, has a, has a major impact on thousands of people uh, living under occupation too. That has to be taken into account somehow. And if you if you know how to balance, please, I, I'm, I'm 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 all ears. Oh, it's, a, yeah. it's a true dilemma. It's a really true dilemma, and yeah. I think it's a political decision that you take when you take this um, um, uh, when you take this um, or a PR decision. It's a PR decision. Right. It's a fi yeah. it's, it's a, no, it's a financial decision. This is what I was saying. I, due diligence goes not only with uh, what your minimal IHL criminal-like uh, responsibilities. When you are doing due diligence, and this is why companies have decided different things, yes, but some have taken their business out of the West Bank, some are not doing business with Israelis, and so we, okay, it's not something that uh, I can think it's, uh, it's not because it's a legal decision, but per se. It's a decision which is mixed with PR, yeah. with financial, with others, okay. and, 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 and I would, this, my previous comment was that I would, um, I, it, it's, not, it, it's not only a legal uh, issue, no, and it's very not, it's not a good thing to look at it only through the uh, legal uh, 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 glass. And if you mention the targeting procedures, and uh, I, for example, I know something about these. Uh, many of these are uh, influenced by uh, um, policy considerations, and like when when you're not pushing proportionality, if I already uh, mentioned that before, to the limits, 
because you are having policy considerations, which are we don't want uh, civilians to be killed even if we think it would be proportionate. This is due diligence in uh, targeting procedures to, as, as well. Right. So um, I would, this is why I said before, the, 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 the a very, very convincing and point and very important point I, I, I am from my humble opinion, my humble uh, perspective about IHL uh, uh, relevance to business conducting uh, we're in, co in conflict uh, uh, stricken areas. That's a very good point. Uh, and there are already norms that the only question is what is the inter right interpretation. But uh, when the minute that from that point the, 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 there are some core uh, duties that IHL, there's no doubt that IHL, we can say that IHL poses, and we have even criminal records for that, from right. starting from Nuremberg, as you said. But as you went further and further and further, I see what, you, what you're saying, but at some point it's not only legal, uh, no, uh, legal duties. I can contend, I can uh, raise uh, claims that saying that uh, about, a, um, uh, about a business uh, 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 conducted in the uh, West Bank, and not, not every business would say it would be like that. But this is why I think SolarStream decision has nothing to do with not doing, uh, not being a war criminal, uh, not being a war criminal, just a different decision. It's not on the basis of... That's, that's not my understanding at all, actually. But, um, we need to finish. Okay. So, um, <laughs> anyway, <laughs> it's complicated, I think. <laughs> it's complicated. That's the lawyer's answer. Line. But yeah. one thing I think we should remember after 50 years of occupation, concerning the Israeli Palestinian conflict. Any complexity and any gray zone and any um, um, making things more um, um, going, f going and moving away or trying to be creative beyond the uh, IHL framework will be used by the occupation and by the colonial uh, uh, enterprise. It's, we know it for sure. We have 50 years of experience. Uh, including uh, 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 human rights organization, w which will admit it. For example, Bezalem, which stop, uh, for example, um, uh, cooperating with the army. It's, it's one example. Uh, so this this one thing I think we should remember, and the line should be very strict after this. This is what this is my my personal opinion. If, even even if Palestinians like. Common people will, will have to pay some some price uh, for that. And I respect that for the for the greater cause, you know, for the independence. And that's a very good point. We <laughs> stop uh, this session. Uh, thank you, Jonathan. Thank you. Thank you.